uh, Julian Gill Peterson. Uh, as I mentioned, Julian is a recipient of a uh, fellowship from the Chair in Transgender Studies. Uh, Julian is an assistant professor of English and Gender and Sexuality and Women's Studies at the University of Pittsburgh and the author of a book called Histories of the Transgender Child. Uh, today's talk is called Against Transsexuality, uh, Spirituality as Trans Feminine Practice in 1950s California. Thanks everyone for coming out during uh, lunchtime. Um, I've had such a lovely visit to you, Vic, so far. I'm so grateful for the opportunity that the, the Visiting Fellowship Program um, through the Chair in Trans Studies offers for folks like myself to spend a lot of time in the archives, which is what I've been doing um, since uh, last week. Um, and I'm really excited to get to share some of this totally brand new work um, that goes along with some of the research I'm doing here. Um, I mentioned this to, to Aaron the other day, but I'm happy to, to repeat it um, right now. You know, I would say that like for folks like myself, you know, at my own institution, I'm probably the only person that <laughs> works in trans studies, <laughs> or certainly in trans history. Um, and so the sort of ethos of this institution in place and the folks that work here, uh, and its sort of commitment to lifting up the scholarship and work of trans people, whether activists, scholars, or community members, is just really sort of palpable as a visitor. Um, and so my heartfelt thanks to Aaron for everything that is being done through the chair, and special thanks also to Michael for all the labor that's gone into both my visit and setting up this talk, and I can't believe I'm also giving another talk tomorrow. Um, I feel you know, lucky to get to do that. Um, but this, this talk here, uh, I would say, kind of emerges at a really productive for me, but also kind of troublesome convergence of my work in trans history with a personal desire and a kind of need to move towards what I might call stranger, but also less heavy archives after having spent the last five years researching in medical archives. Uh, and as well as a sort of intensely political need to probe the value of illogic and unreason in a moment of political attack. So for the past couple of months, or since last October, at many of the trans studies events that I've participated in in the US, um, we've sort of been trying to make sense of a leaked memo from the US Department of Health and Human Services that revealed, back in October, plans to move ahead with a cruel and aggressive anti-trans policy of defining gender exclusively by sex assignment at birth, and also making that category immutable. So an attempt to completely disqualify trans people from access to much of the US federal government's institutions and services. So I've been thinking a lot in the wake of that memo and how within the extremely narrow terms of recent trans inclusion, which has largely revolved around sort of the smallest possible expansion uh, of bureaucratic categories and a lot of investment in the medical model that we sort of have very little evidence that reason will be especially useful in fighting this latest attack. Because I think, you know, on the one hand, it would be fairly easy um, for us to sort of debunk and deconstruct this memo's illogic to point out how perilously weak the presumption is that gender can be defined by sex assigned at birth. And among other things, I would I guess I consider that sort of part of my job to do that kind of debunking work. Uh, and, and I think, but I actually think to demonstrate the logic of that memo's attempted retrenchment of the binary, we actually do very little to interrupt the administrative power of the state to make such determinations. So as long as the state is empowered to govern the population through sex and gender, that administrative power and the distinct vulnerability that it creates for trans, non-binary, uh, and intersex people is really protected. So in this sort of broader situation, I've really been hung up on an older feeling that there can be something kind of magical to transness as a mode of being and knowing that it can unlock forms of knowledge and experience that otherwise remain obscure in this time and place in which we find ourselves. Whether that sense of sort of magic can intervene against the administrative power of the state is an open question but it's one that I sort of want to ask and explore. And so in this talk, I want to share um, some stories of a group of trans women that I've been researching for the past year who met regularly in Southern California at the turn of the 1950s. Because they authored a largely unremembered schema for a set of DIY or do-it-yourself trans practices 
that I think can serve as the start of a counter history to the politically depressed emergencies and inertia of our present moment. And I sort of think of this group of woman, women as offering, among other things, a historical kind of testimony to that sense of magic that I've intuited and really found myself needing these past few months more than any. These trans women were skeptical of the value of medical science and its corresponding reason, and they turned to domains more enchanted and maybe more spiritual to find a more capacious understanding of gender and transness than was being offered at the time. And my thinking about this group of women also serves within a larger book project that I'm sort of provisionally calling Gender Underground, a history of trans DIY as a kind of counter narrative to a form of occulting that the medical model has imposed since the mid 20th century. And uh, that would be the sort of singularization of trans narratives by medicine. So in The Empire Strikes Back, a post-transsexual manifesto, San Sandy Stone suggests at one point that, quote, transsexuals for whom gender identity is something different from and perhaps irrelevant to physical genitalia are occulted by those for whom the power of medical psychological establishments is the final authority for what counts as a culturally intelligible body. We have relatively few sources of trans historiography to begin with, so it's perhaps not surprising that the medical model's overall signature effect, which is to reduce the richness of trans life, experience, and self-knowledge into a more singular narrative, which for a long time has been about binary transition, of course it has effects on history as well. But I want to take Stone's choice of the word occulted um, very seriously, as I think it offers a unique opportunity to think about what counter-narratives might affirm what once, you know, having been occulted, has lain in plain sight in the past, untapped but always available to us. So not nearly so vague as, you know, transness equals magic, I hope. I want to offer some archival vignettes from research I've been doing, um, and I'm going to sort of move through kind of three um, places in that archive. I'll start with a hex painted on a house in 1954, then a trans woman's blistering critique of the medical model made at the start of the 1950s, mailed to students in a correspondence course on how to do transition DIY. And third, thinking a little bit about the opaque social world of trans women uh, that met in Long Beach, California in the early 1950s, who, whose otherwise very sort of staid class and racial positionality um, might nonetheless invite sort of new readings of the value of the category transvestism um, in, within trans studies and trans history. So before I dive all the way in, just one quick caveat, which is I'm thinking of this talk sort of as like a tour of some of these archives that I've been spending time, time in. Um, you know, this is pretty new thinking, um, part of a totally new project that I've just started this year, and so I'm super eager for thoughts and feedback. Um, and I'm also thinking of this as, as being sort of the beginning or the first chapter of that project. So just to give a little broader snapshot, um, this, this broader book I'm thinking of, Gender Underground, will pursue the argument that the do-it-yourself or DIY has been an important historical home for trans knowledge and practice since the mid 20th century. And in, in making that argument, I just sort of want to take aim against medicine and the state's authority to structure trans history and legibility. Uh, so combining research in community archives with some oral histories and looking at a couple of artists, the book will offer DIYs a framework for writing trans history without preformed models of identity, publicity, and their correspondent governmentality that have over the past 70 years increasingly constricted transness within a specific kind of grammar that I think often assumes a Western neoliberal subject. So to denature that grammar, the book really privileges the overlapping experiences of some of the folks who have been much less legible in trans history to date. Those who found refuge in the opacity of the private sphere, those <coughs> who lived poor in cities and on the street, and trans of color folks as well. And so what I'm gonna talk about today is more sort of the former people who have found refuge in, in the private sphere and have been sort of less visible because of that. But across the chapters, I'm sort of thinking of a book project that would trace a kind of underground lineage um, in which we can see really inventive ways of getting access to hormones, alternate routes to surgery, and care for the self and others in ways that move way far outside any medicalized or normalized concept of transition. And so I begin with this account of the 1950s, 
precisely because I want to find one that doesn't center on the advent of transsexuality, although it will come up, or it doesn't revolve around you know, a famous trans person like Christine Jorgensen, but rather a generation of little known trans women in California who authored really sharp critiques of medicalization and turned to alternative practices to affirm their womanhood that we might sort of call spiritual. Though I should say in invoking the spiritual in this talk, I'm taking the term pretty loosely. Um, mostly to name practices and knowledge that present themselves as diverging from Western hegemonic forms of disciplinary knowledge and reason like medical science. Um, but I hope that term maybe helps to unify some of the things I'm talking about, but I'm open to suggestions on better terms to use. Okay, so let's rewind the clock. And I want to start with this image reproduced from the San Francisco Chronicle in 1954. In a section that cataloged sort of lighthearted happenings around town, the paper printed this photograph of Louise Lawrence, one of the most famous trans women in the US in this, area, or in this era, and certainly one of the most well-connected. Lawrence maintained a huge network of correspondence with other trans people around the US and the world, as well as a very vital kind of social and local network in the San Francisco Bay Area, where she lived and elsewhere in California in particular. So Lawrence was personally responsible for connecting uh, famous researchers like Alfred Kinsey or the endocrinologist Harry Benjamin with some of their first trans acquaintances, which really helped them establish you know, their research on the subject. And by the 1950s, when this piece was published, she already had a decade of expertise in uh, organizing and knowledge from within the trans community under her belt. But if the Chronicle had any awareness of it, they didn't print it. Lawrence is identified by name, though it's spelled wrong, uh, and the photo is clear enough to recognize her face, but there isn't any mention um, of who she is other than that or anything uh, mentioning that you know, she was trans. But rather, the caption directs us to something else. I think it's too interesting not to quote the whole thing. Part of it's up there. There is no sound reason why art and superstition cannot be mixed, and mixed even on the broad side of a red house. Louise Lawrence proved it yesterday at 11 Buena Vista Terrace. She swung herself up on a bosun's chair and painted herself some real, genuine, authentic, Amish sect signs. They are guaranteed to ward off evil spirits if any should chance by. Miss Lawrence knows because she has studied the sect and interior decoration. They may not be guaranteed against spirits, but she believes they add a little pleasant decor to her home. From a letter written to a friend around this time in which she shares a giggle about this article, I know that Lawrence's hex was above all decorative rather than eminently spiritual. Indeed, in painting the outside of her house with such a sign, she was participating in a broader kitsch trend in American home decor. The Pennsylvania Dutch, for their part, do actually have a really long tradition of painting these kinds of symbols, often on the outsides of barns for actual spiritual purposes. Louise was being, I think, just a little cheeky. I know she didn't consider the hex in any particularly Pennsylvanian Dutch sense, let alone in a more occult sense. But nonetheless, I sort of want to offer this hex at the outset as a kind of frame for the historiographical project I'm interested in, as a kind of invocation of the gender underground that I'm calling into being for this project. Um, so not quite only as a temporal formation, but also as a spatial one. So underground as sort of attention to what has lain in sort of in plain sight next to or underneath scenes that otherwise appear to be the sort of height of post-war American conformity, in this case, white middle-class feminine domesticity. And so the question that I think the Hex lets us ask is, if, well, what if some of those scenes were actually trans all along they were just submerged, and the hex is sort of like our clue. And so part of what I want to reassess in this community that took shape at the turn of the 1950s is the way that the historical figures who traveled under the sign and category transvestism, like Louise, are more complicated than the stigmatized narratives that long circulated around them and referred to them as sort of heterosexual cross-dressers, um, that there was a lot more actually going on. I think to a certain extent, the agency that people who identified as transvestites exercised to create underground social roles was premised on the way that many of them did sort of lead dual lives, going to work dressed as men during the day and only able to dress and get together as themselves on the weekends, special occasions, or sometimes by driving out to motels or nature retreats to safely socialize in clubs. 
behind closed doors and away from surveillance. In that sense, some of them continue to draw on, but also reroute some of the resources accorded to white middle-class American men in a decade in which nearly the entire resources of the United States and its imperial transnational capital interests were directed towards the upward mobility of that group above all. And so to be clear, I don't really see this as straightforwardly recuperable history in any obviously political sense, but I do think we have sort of underestimated what might have been going on in these otherwise highly normative scenes um, if we don't sort of dig into uh, their opacity. Um, because actually of the way that class and whiteness allowed some of these folks to blend in to the post-war landscape so they could get away with other things that they weren't being surveilled for. But actually Lawrence is not a good example of this um, because she made the decision in 1944 to live full-time as Louise, giving up entirely any claim she might have had to being recognized by the state as a man. So as her diary from the first year of her transition testifies, Living as Louise at a time when she had to figure everything out DIY had a huge personal cost. Her marriage ended and she lost custody of her child. And while Louise did have ostensibly supportive doctors like Carl Bowman, a psychiatrist at the local Langley Porter Clinic in the 1940s, they didn't really offer any of the components um, of transition that we might associate with the sort of 1950s and later era. So without hormones without electrolysis or voice therapy, Louise began living full-time as a woman, as Louise, in 1944, teaching herself through daily practice how to pass in public, getting a job as a waitress in the Knob Hill neighborhood, and immersing herself in the queer bar scene in wartime San Francisco. Her diary from this year has sort of constant references, though, to deep depressive feelings, that record how much of a challenge all of these incredible achievements really were and the kind of toll that they took on her since she had to figure them all out by herself. But a, year, you know, a decade later, when this Chronicle photo was taken, Louise had not only lived as Louise for that whole decade, but was now a really important figure for many other trans people, both locally and through correspondents who really looked up to her and considered her a kind of leader in the community. And one of Louise's contemporaries was a trans woman named Edith Ferguson, you see it on the left there, uh, who lived in Long Beach, which is you know, at the very southern tip of Los Angeles in Southern California. Louise and Edith knew each other actually pretty well because Louise often made trips down to Los Angeles, and all of them met in the Long Beach home of a mutual friend named Joanne Thornton. And you see some of those folks meeting at Joanne's on the right in that photo. This um, Long Beach group, as they were sometimes referred to by inquiring researchers like Kinsey, put together a newsletter in 1952, which was edited by Joanne, that bore the name Transvestia. Lasting only two issues, it served as a platform for arguing for the depathologization and destigmatization of transvestism at the turn of the 1950s. They also levied some critiques of the new medical model of transsexuality that was just barely on the radar in the US in 1952. So really kind of in real time as it's coming into existence. And if you've heard the name Transvestia before, it's likely that probably you're thinking of the magazine that bore that name for many decades published by Virginia Prince, who's perhaps the best known um, American from this era whose life sort of associated with that category of transvestism and later you know, transgender, which a term that perhaps even she helped to coin. But Prince began um, printing her iteration of Transvesti in 1962, so a decade later. At the turn of the 1950s, she was part of this Long Beach group to a certain extent and contributed to that first newsletter iteration. And at that time, she uh, more often went by the name Muriel, which shows up a few times in that 1952 newsletter. So this Long Beach group, you can sort of tell, so it sounds like some of the details that I have are sort of hazy, it's because they're not that much more than a sort of footnote in trans history at the moment. There are kind of a few whispers about them here or there. Um, so Edith Ferguson is mentioned through a different pseudonym in a few lines in Jayanne uh, Merowitz's field-defining book, How Sex Changed a History of Transsexuality in the United States. And just from asking them, I know that both Susan Stryker and C. Jacob Hale have come across references to Ferguson and Joanne you know, at various points in their, in their research, most likely often in relation to Virginia Prince. But the full membership of this Long Beach group is still largely unknown, even to me. So, you know, on this picture in the right, you can see there's a couple of 
folks gathered. One of them, the one um, you know, closest to the camera is Joanne, um, but I haven't been able to really identify everyone else in that photograph yet. I have a sort of collection of other names, first names, but it's hard to sort of figure out who is who. And so Joanne was the original editor of this 1952 version of Transvestia, and in a letter that she sent to Kinsey after that issue came out, she explained that, quote, I have a desire within me to do some good in the world, a crusader's complex. This desire is channeled onto the problem of transvestites. I want to do all I can to alleviate the miseries of the transvestite. Since 1942, I've contacted 144 of them, and I think that they are the most unhappy of people. They are unhappy because they are misunderstood. In a small way, I like to think of myself as another Dr. Kinsey. I am motivated by the same desires that you have. Transvestia now has 40 regular subscribers. They are one and all emotionally dependent upon this medium. They send in all they can to help finance the journal, but it is not enough to pay for its publication." End quote. So as that last line starts to allude to, Transvestia only made it through two issues, and as she explained in, the, in a later letter to Kinsey, Joanne just ran out of money. Not enough donations came in from her subscribers, many of whom, like her, um, she actually worked as a janitor at a local high school, were quite poor. And because it was still under U.S. obscenity law likely illegal to publish and distribute a publication on the subject, it proved really impossible to kind of solicit any other more mainstream funding, even from researchers like Kinsey or other people who had access to um, uh, money for, for academic research. So I won't get into the two issues of the newsletter in great detail, but they incorporate a kind of range of editorials penned pseudonymously by members of the Long Beach group, as well as a huge number of um, excerpts from letters that Joanne had received from some of her many pen pals. So it is a kind of interesting look at you know, what people were talking about at that time. Muriel, aka Virginia Prince, is mentioned, as is Louise Lawrence. The newsletter's editorials overall kind of argue that transvestism is not pathological, that it did not deserve any of the social stigma it received, and that it was a great double standard of US society that women were increasingly allowed to wear pants in public, but men could not similarly wear dresses. The newsletter also had a decidedly heteronormative, if not right, hom outright homophobic kind of slant to it, um, taking sort of great pains to emphasize that transvestites are only ever attracted to women, and that in, in that sense, they were somehow still men. But despite that kind of official party line in the print version, I think the reality was a lot more complicated, and many of the members of the Long Beach group and the newsletter subscribers certainly felt or sort of privately wondered or wrote to one another um, about whether it was not better for them to think of themselves as lesbians. And I think their understandings of gender also took on a huge array of different forms and expressions that don't really reflect what ended up getting published in the newsletter. Um, but, you know, despite this sort of interesting moment and the existence of this original transvestia, Edith, Joanne, and their comrades in Long Beach were almost erased entirely by the passage of time. So I'd sort of found references to them here or there, often through correspondence, uh, and through that I eventually found some addresses for them, listing where they lived in 1951. And so this, fast, this past fall, I decided to go to Long Beach and try and just find out where they were, <laughs> um, kind of... To be honest, I, I was going to LA for research anyways, and I sort of had this fanciful feeling that I just needed to see where they had lived. Um, I didn't exactly know what I thought I was going to find there. Um, and it was sort of a bittersweet lesson in the historical effects of gentrification on trans history. So I went to the Long Beach Municipal Records, where I was able to find some fire insurance maps from 1950, and that's one of them there on the right. Because when I had plugged in these addresses I had found, I noticed they didn't exist. Uh, in contemporary Long Beach, so I assumed that the city had been redeveloped at some point. But I did find the addresses listed on the old fire maps, and as you can see, we've got Edith's house and Joanne's house. I mean, they're very much in central Long Beach, pretty much downtown, quite close to the beach. And so I, I, I grabbed those addresses and figured out where they corresponded to and decided to walk out from the municipal records and go find them. And this is what I found. The entire neighborhood was torn down to make way for a freeway on off-ramp in the 1960s. So though Long Beach has actually kind of a centuries-old queer and trans history to it, making it perhaps one of the most visibly historically LGBT cities in the whole US, there's actually no way to know passing through the city center here that this place was once home 
to a vibrant social world of trans women at the turn of the 50s. But it was very vibrant. Here you can see a few more photos of the gals relaxing and having fun at Joanne's place. Those are on the left. And on the right are a couple of portraits that Joanne had taken at different points in the 1950s. Really kind of gorgeous portraiture, I think. Oh, she's also holding a cat in one picture, which I just love. And these were actually preserved by none other than Louise Lawrence, who kept a, just an incredible photo album that's now at the Kinsey Institute. The front page, um, page of it is called Transvestites I Have Known. It's just pictures of all the folks that she had saved over the years. And so I'd actually been researching this Long Beach group for about eight months, um, including having gone to Long Beach and sort of turning up at a freeway on off ramp. And I had no idea what they looked like still. And when I was reading Louise's scrapbook last October, I just opened this page, you know, I didn't know it was there. Uh, and I'm not embarrassed to say I totally gasped out loud in the archival reading room because I never thought I would find out what they looked like or get to sort of meet them in this more intimate way in a space where they felt safe to be themselves and take the risk of putting out a sort of underground newsletter. And so I'm just really excited to get to share photos like this with anyone um, when, I, when I get a chance to present this work. But I want to focus the rest of my time specifically on Edith Ferguson, because she reached a level of erudition and produced an incredible corpus of critical work that actually I, I would just happily name as one more origin story for the field of transgender studies. I think she was doing trans studies in the 1950s. And Ferguson did all of this, not in the newsletter, but in her very own correspondence course in DIY transition. So starting around 1950 or 1951, she began to advertise in magazines and other print forums for a correspondence course in female impersonation. So here's an example of one of those ads. It's kind of hard to see, but it says, um, legitimate instruction in female impersonation to qualified students only through male lectures. Edith Ferguson, 35 Crescent Avenue, Long Beach, California. Um, and, and this was in Billboard magazine. And of course, female impersonation was often sort of parlance for drag in the 50s. Um, but lest we assume this was a course in how to perform on stage or be a drag queen, in reality, Ferguson developed a fully fledged kind of DIY program in what she called transmutation, which she offered as an alternative to transition in the sense of what the new medical model in the 1950s was just starting to bring into existence. So the total cost of this course was a whopping $375, and interested students had to send Edith uh, their photo and a written, quote, close personal description of so many things, their appearance, their voice, their mannerism, their personality, other physical attributes, and then talk about their sort of uh, work and family life. And if Ferguson selected them as a worthy student, they would be mailed one to two or sometimes three of her lectures every week to read and digest. They often had sort of exercise in them, and you sort of paid the course fee by installment as you went along. So with practice and by corresponding personally with Ferguson for guidance, over 18 months, students were to complete this full transmutation course, according to Ferguson, quote, approximating attendance at a standard girls' finishing school. And so although the exact sort of number of lectures that she produced is hard to figure out, um, in 1959, for instance, she described in the letter that she had well over 200, because she kind of wrote them personalized for every single person. And by the time she kind of sat down to do this work uh, and teach her, her trans pupils, Ferguson was already retired. She'd had a long career in law. But the body of knowledge that comprised her courses was really wide. So in a letter to Kinsey, who she sent tons of these lectures to, which is how we still have access to some of them. She explained that uh, they were basically created out of five areas of her expertise, um, what she called experience in histrionics, which is to say vaudeville, circus, and other acting techniques, uh, experience in athletics, experience in law, experience in dramatic instruction in the stage, and, ex and then what she called experience and effort as a student of medical science, physiology, psychology, and the more important psychiatric aspects. So she was sort of a kind of a renaissance person in that sense. Um, one of the aspects of the lectures I think is really kind of incredible to read is Ferguson's really sharply argued critique of the medicalization of trans people because it was just happening at that moment in a new way in the US. 
Because of Ferguson's age, she was more well immersed in early 20th century sexology, endocrinology, and biology. So she had been more familiar with the medical literature on transvestism, sort of coming out of Germany and other places in Europe early in the century. And so she really subscribed to uh, an older scientific point of view that human life was not binary at all. Um, as she put it in one lecture, quote, to basic medical knowledge, there is but one sex, the human sex. This sex is differentiated into two different phases of expression, one masculine and the other feminine, end quote. So she sort of argued that all human life always had the latent potential to become both sexes. This was a concept that was really losing popularity in science in the 50s, but it had been absolutely a dominant belief amongst biologists and sexologists for really the, at least the preceding five decades. So Ferguson's sort of overall thesis was that transvestites like herself could activate their latent femininity through the energetic force of their cultivated thoughts and aesthetic sensibilities affecting real biological changes in the body greater than anything offered by official doctors. And um, here's sort of a picture on the left. You see a list of 56 of the lectures she sent to someone. <laughs> And then there's just an excerpt from one of the lectures to give you a sense of what it would be like to receive those in the mail. So when Christine Jorgensen became front page news in the, in the early 50s, Ferguson, who was already running this course, um, started to sort of critique that medical model a little more outright, not to admonish or criticize the desirability of transition for other trans folks, but actually just to critique how it was being covered in the media um, because of the way in which medicine was sort of posturing itself as having achieved a kind of total scientific control over the human body and mind. So in one of these lectures, she wrote a whole lecture about Christine Jorgensen, and this is what she says at one point. Quote, on the whole, Christine makes a very nice, sweet, and dedicated appearance of femininity. Yet, the bald fact remains that many other transvestites, sans operative procedure, have done and are doing the same thing for each and all of the foregoing reasons and expressions indicated by high medical authority, the pedigree pre presented by Christine Jorgensen while intriguing and offering a picture of vague hope to the discouraged transvestus is not as convincing as an indication of a complete change of sex. So I think achieving a complete change of sex, according to Ferguson, was something that medicine could not do because it was premised on a normalizing project in which trans people had to submit to the narrow vision of doctors who neglected anything other than sort of producing a binary appearing kind of body. So for Ferguson, transsexuality neglected the expanded sphere of trans feminine life that she was covering in her lectures. So I think she also thought of herself as a rival of these doctors. This is how she put it uh, in a letter to Joanne in 1955. I don't believe in surgery alone, for it is like most things in this world, that is to say, it is good so far as it goes, but it cannot go far enough. So there's a lot more I could say about that aspect of the lectures, and I'm happy to talk about them you know, in our discussion after. But I really want to get to the heart of this DIY process through which she offered transmutation. When it came to transmutation itself, Ferguson composed a kind of set of practices and exercises that combined theories of acting, coming all the way out of the vaudeville stage, um, including some of the techniques of a really famous early female impersonator, a drag queen, Julian Eltinge. She combined that with a theory of energetic thoughts, effects on biology, more about that in a second, a discourse on aura and color, more about that in a second too. And this was all combined into a process that basically ends in the cultivation of what Ferguson referred to as, quote, a divine phase of being, in which the body and the mind transmute together from masculine to feminine. And so what I'm going to do is I'm sort of going to let her speak because as that one quote I already read probably suggests to you, she's really long-winded and really idiosyncratic in her writing. It's a very strange discourse. I'm fascinated by the way she writes. Um, and I will not pretend that I could paraphrase any better than the way she actually puts it herself. I think there's something alluring, if confusing, about how she <laughs> expresses herself. So I'm going to sort of offer two extended excerpts from the lectures that I hope show, show a bit of a clear picture of what transmutation consisted of. And I really want to let her voice speak to us through me um, as if we are her students. So I won't actually offer a ton of analysis before I sort of wrap things up. But here first is a long excerpt, excerpt from lecture 10b, which I do believe is what we see the photo of there as well. So. Okay. <clears throat> 
giving vent then to this desire of the transvestic individual for self-expression, constant practice and intelligent cultivation of feminine attributes through artificial means and coordinated study, training, practice and rehearsal is simply bound to have dual effects upon the personality, i.e. one, upon the mental attitude which can evidence itself in thinking like a woman, and two, upon the feminizing of the physical contour by natural or artificial means within the circumscriptive areas for development. It may even result in some sort of biological alteration. So here she's sort of talking about the power of thought to actually change biology and change the body. She goes on, it can certainly operate mechanically and thence correspondingly as an induction for pseudo acceleration of femininity in some degree of functioning. Simply put, it is action and reaction, a phase of self, self hypnosis stimulating the areas of physical activity and the mental concepts in a certain direction along a certain pathway repetition making paths worn smooth, thus impressing the functional state upon the conscious, later the subconscious phases of mind, so that the entire adaptation of a transverse personality becomes automatic, and can eventually reach quite beyond this to the stage where aesthetic transmutation in toto becomes realized, so that the subject lives thereafter in the life, if not merely the fantasy of the adoptive characterization number of individuals have done this. Many are doing so. Yet little is known of the truth because A, the whole point of inquiry is hush-hush through the condemnatory attitude of society and the paucity of juridical wisdom. B, the individuals are themselves averse to revelation except before a group of others similarly inclined. And C, the matter of a truly authentic changeover is never discovered except by accident gives you a sense. That was just her describing <laughs> transmutation and why it's so hard to figure out. Here is one more long excerpt. This is from lecture number 76. And here she's going to talk a little bit about how she's imagining this idea that um, truly thinking and believing oneself and embodying womanhood would cause a physical alteration of the self. Quote, it is my fond theory and belief that the only way in which a genetic masculine entity may attain this stage is to completely absorb the identity of the feminine ego. In other words, you will think like a woman when you feel that you are the woman you are characterizing, provided that you have properly trained yourself to respond in the manner indicated in these lectures. But just feeling alone isn't quite sufficient either. You must proceed to actually motivate your thought processes and mentally seek, grope for, and collect inspiration in the idea of an aura, a mental atmosphere of femininity. And you must definitely abandon the cruder, logical processes of masculinity. Again, you must consciously create this aura, create it by inducing a feeling of completed femininity. Cross-dressing will certainly help with a certain amount of auto-hypnosis, for what you do is actually think it into existence. What is this aura? Scientific investigators have discovered the fact that a mental aura is a sort of colored atmosphere. It is colored by various hues perceived under the electrospectroscope, and briefly these colors or hues depend for their existence upon the thoughts and feelings of the individual. They are a radiation of such thoughts in projected outline, resulting in feelings. And these feelings, in turn, radiate out from the individuals to a distance of approximately three feet and consciously or unconsciously sway the motives of other persons who are physically close enough and mentally receptive enough to become affected thereby." End quote. Okay, so as you know, best as I can decipher, part of what she's sort of saying here is that um, there's a way to measure the, the force of, of the kind of aesthetic cultivation of sense of self and thought that actually radiates out from the organism in the form of these sort of color auras and that um, one would work through the sort of DIY practices of dressing, walking, talking, stage techniques that she put together uh, in everyday life to the point that this aura was, this feminine ego was being radiated to be then reabsorbed causing the, the body to transform or transmutate, as she put it, and that that would allow for the, a reaching a sort of what she called, again, the divine, the divine level of femininity that medicine could never offer because it had no interest in that sort of aesthetic, spiritual um, mind component of, of, of womanhood. <laughs>
So I think of this program in transmutation as somewhat of a spiritual alternative to the medical model, though not one that is entirely unreasonable in its content. It is, after all, based in her own lay scientific knowledge, as well as acting and other stage methods. Uh, and really, she was corresponding with Kinsey. The one connection I can find to Victoria is that she sent her lectures to a Dr. Alcorn that was practicing here in the 50s. I haven't been able to figure anything else out about him, but they had a bit of a lively correspondence about transvestism. So, you know, there's some involvement still of these kinds of scientific knowledges, but I think that her sense of the force of thought and this feminine aura to be projected outward and reabsorbed to the point of causing biological <coughs> and personality changes that allow for life as a woman are kind of just too interesting and expansive for me not to name them, at least in part, as a kind of transfeminine spiritual practice. So she wasn't just against transsexuality, as the title of this lecture suggested, but Ferguson rather created a full DIY course to train in a more capacious field of transfeminine flourishing for worthy students. And it seems that not too many were worthy. <laughs> um, by 1955, she'd given up teaching the course, complaining that students didn't take it seriously enough. Not enough of them were committing to living full time as women and um, weren't, weren't taking it as seriously as she wanted. And this included not just the people that she was mailing this to, but some of her closest friends and confidants like Joanne. So in the archive, I, re I read this wild, like 12 page long, vicious letter that Edith sent to Joanne where she criticizes her lack of commitment to the deep work of transmutation and says that explains all of Joanne's struggles with being unhappy. Um, it's, it's pretty exacting. It's pretty, it's, it has a sort of sense of like, it's very pedagogical, but it's, it's, it's pretty tough. I don't know how I would have felt receiving that letter. Um, but even if not that many of her fellow trans women completed the course, I think it stands as a remarkable testimony to the depth and breadth of trans DIY practice in the mid-century, a direct challenge to thinking of this time period as dominated by the advent of the, the medical model. <coughs> so the three trans women I've talked about today, Louise Lawrence, Edith Ferguson, and Joanne Thornton, were to differ differing degrees occulted by trans history with capital H, obscured to the degree that their relations to transness didn't correspond to the singular mode of the medical model. But none of them fit that well into the colloquial conceptualization of the term transvestism either. Both Louise and Edith, as I said, live full time as women, including renting their homes and conducting all their business under their, their, uh, their names. And they renounced entirely their former lives. Joanne probably still you know, had to go to work dressed as a man, but otherwise she lived you know, most of her life in the 50s as a woman as well. So much of the details of their lives remain still very opaque. Um, so I'm not done looking into them, but, but not only because they don't quite fit in with the received way of thinking about trans womanhood in this era, I think part of it is also that it's just difficult to track them down and find evidence for their lives. It's sort of scattered around archives all over the US. And as I showed you, there's nothing left sort of in Long Beach to, to, to see about where they were. But despite those challenges, I think these three women also offer their own not quite occult counter projects, but certainly projects that at moments embrace unreason and illogic in ways that I think lead us to start to think more about this sort of underground of gender in the post-war era as an immense source of knowledge, and importantly from the vantage point of 2019, coordinates for a past that hardly had any inevitable endpoint in our current situation. So I hope that beyond just the chance to share their stories with you today, that you might be willing to think of yourself, like me, as students of Edith Ferguson, perhaps, you know, we might have quarrels with her, but um, as, as interested and willing participants in a longer tradition of trans feminine being and knowing practices at once critical of medical science, but also embracing and affirming of alternate approaches to living a trans life. Uh, and really a trans world from the turn of the 1950s that I just think has remained hidden, if in plain sight, for far too long. Thank you.